What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Linux Live. We've got uh, a pretty fun conversation. I know, uh, you know, we've obviously been talking a lot about the GH6 over uh, pretty much over the last month. Uh, the latest, greatest, newest camera always gets kind of the spotlight for a while, but um, I, I felt now was a good time to actually kind of go back and start looking at some of the, the other cameras as well, you know, the S5. There's a lot of conversations that go around online of comparing cameras like the GH6 to an S5. What makes the most sense for someone when you're looking at cameras that are relatively about the same price point? And most of that stuff really, you know, comes into some of the different feature sets and whether or not one actually is a better camera for your particular style. So hopefully after today's stream, uh, I've got a bunch of questions that have come in ahead of time that uh, you know I want to address and kind of go over. Uh, but hopefully we can actually kind of clear up some of the the misunderstandings or you know kind of where each of these cameras kind of fit you know really into a general user's workload. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to use all of our cameras both from a training perspective where, you know, I have to know these cameras for my job, but also from an actual user's perspective. Uh, I do photograph and I do create video content outside of working for Panasonic. So I get a ton of hands on with these and I want to be able to share some of the cool features that this camera has that have really kind of added that next level to the photos and videos that I create. Uh, and bring you all along with me on this ride and hopefully hopefully you learn something. Uh, if this is your first Lumix Live that you've joined, these are weekly broadcasts that we do on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, where really we'll either be talking about hardcore technical sides of the cameras, some inspirational conversations about you know filmmakers and photographers. We haven't done many of those recently, but we're looking to get back into it. Uh, and most importantly, it's a forum and a community for all of you to be able to ask questions directly to the brand, to me from Panasonic to be able to answer them for you. Uh, I try to be able to answer as much as I can uh, on these streams. So one way that you can help me identify questions that y'all have is to tag at Lumix cameras before your question, as you can see some are doing in the chat. Uh, that just helps me go through, see the questions that are coming up, and then uh, be able to address them the best I can during the broadcast. Um, outside of that, uh, we have a number of different things that are going on uh, across the board. We have Lumix Pro Services, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, we have our Instagram channel. Uh, it's Lumix USA over on Instagram that I monitor and I interact with. Uh, so if you want to continue these conversations or you just want to check out some cool work or maybe have an opportunity to have your work featured on our page, uh, feel free to go over, follow us on Instagram, uh, drop into our DMs and, and ask away. Uh, we always try to answer as many questions as we can there. Uh, and, and yeah, just keep this kind of community growing. Uh, we are starting to branch out and interact in different platforms as well. So obviously there's Facebook, there's YouTube, which are on now. Instagram as the kind of core ones, but I am also active over on Reddit in the uh, Lumix subreddits uh, as Sean at Lumix. So feel free if you're a Reddit user to tag me in questions over there, and I'm more than happy to uh, you know help you out in that platform as well. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's kind of get into some of the core stuff. Um, so like I mentioned, we have Lumix Pro services here in the United States and abroad. Uh, links are in the description to uh, go to either the global uh, kind of landing page or to the U.S. page. Uh, but Lumix Pro Services offers a uh, level of protection for your equipment. Uh, in, in some ways, a different peace of mind. Uh, we have a RED membership, which is free. Uh, this gets you your three-year extended warranty uh, here in the United States, since we know warranty services are different the country to country. Uh, but the RED membership, it's free to register. If you own a Lumix camera, you can get into it. That's on the list. Uh, it gets you a little welcome kit, uh, 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 user ID and everything. So if you happen to have an issue with a camera, you've got a platform that you can use to get in with us and actually kind of interact. And then uh, we have the Platinum Series, which is a little bit higher level protection. That is if you need uh, you know, much more support on your equipment, you want to be able to send it in for service and... Uh, kind of maintenance throughout the year, 
Uh, definitely check out Lumix uh, Pro Services Platinum. Uh, lots of cool benefits with them, as you can see on the cards that are running there. So feel free to take a look at those. You said links down in the description and the QR codes on there for US uh, members. So uh, let's kind of take a look through some of the questions that we've got here and uh, see what we've got. Um, and I'm getting all kinds of warnings on, on YouTube. So streaming should be okay. Um, everything should be running through. If it gets a little choppy, I apologize. Uh, again, if you've been joining us for a while, Spectrum is just awesome. All right. So some of the questions that came through here. Uh, I've got those queued up. All right. Uh, let's see. Manny says, should I have GH6 today? Is this going to make me feel like I should have gotten an S5? Not necessarily. Um, this is, there's a lot of things. And one of the things I'm going to actually talk about is the, the kind of commonalities between the S5 and the GH6. There are a lot of features that are shared between the two. Um, but one is going to excel in some other areas over the other. So we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, Let's see here. Uh, Mark, uh, I've registered for red. I don't see how to ask for uh, my free CF Express card. Uh, if you're in the U.S., um, you follow the, I believe it's you, you follow the red membership. You get your camera registered on there. Uh, and I think it is part of the pla uh, the program. But if you take a look at LumixGH6.com, uh, about midway through the page, it has the information for uh, the CF Express card uh, for the uh, early adopters. So hopefully that gets you a little bit more info. Uh, let's see here. On your GH5, I can leave live view on and there's no blurring. Uh, GH6 displays can keep up. There's a difference between GH6 and GH5. So we have some other videos that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks on the GH6, but what I will talk about today is going to be in reference to the S5 uh, mark, uh, but it's going to be relevant to how you set up things like live... Um, not live composite... Um, Wow, I can't think of the name of it because it's on the camera. Um, for uh, the preview, uh, constant preview, and how it actually works and ways that you can set it up. Because on the GH6 and on the S5, it's a little different than how cameras like the uh, G85 were. Uh, let's see here. Uh, any update on getting timestamp uh, in the next firmware update? Uh, I've been asking this for a long time, but sure could use it for legal dep uh, depositions. Uh, some of our cameras do have timestamp. Uh, so I know like the S1H does. I think the GH5, GH5S, and GH5 Mark II do. I have to double check. Um, I have asked about the GH6 if that's something that's coming in a firmware update or if it's something that can be done. Uh, but I don't have another update for uh, you just yet on that. Uh, let's see here. Um, are you using the GH6 for the stream today? Yes, I am. Uh, I have uh, changed things up a little bit. Um, I had to use my uh, <laughs> I had to use my uh, BS1H uh, for something else, so I've got my GH6 hooked up here. Uh, I'm using the face tracking and the one area, not one area. The um, wow, why can't I think of the name of it? It's just one of those days. Uh, the group area uh, AF mode. So I've got that set about right here and then it's got my face. So yeah, we're using, uh, AF and the 15 millimeter F 1.7, uh, on the GH six for this stream. Uh, we've also updated some other stuff to our stream for those that care. Uh, we're using a, a new capture card instead of the ATEM for this. So yeah, for those that have been following along, that's a lot, but let's get into the crux of what this, uh, what the stream's about today. And it's about the S five. There are so many cool features that we've added to a lot of the cameras as we've kind of evolved them over the years that in a lot of cases either can get overlooked because they're not as common uh, and they are fairly unique to some of the Lumix lineups. And that's things like if you've seen in the description, live view composite, high resolution shot mode, uh, and even into things like 4K, 6K photo, uh, our different uh, tools for astrophotography or night sky photographers, different... Um, added things that we've added into this for really just making your shooting experience that much more uh, enjoyable and easy. So I want to go through some of these in a little bit of an order. Uh, so one of the questions that came in early on was about live composite and about, you know, can you use the individual images separately or does, you know, can you do it where it creates like a time-lapse creation of this? And 
The short answer is no. Uh, there isn't a way to pull out all the individual frames, and there isn't a way to do a video file for it, but there's a couple different cool things that you can do to get the same look out of it. Um, so I want to jump over to my S5 here. Uh, and actually, as I just realized, my face is not going to be on here, so give me two seconds. Uh, like I said, we've got a new... Uh... Hi, there I am. We have a new uh, uh, capture card that I've got set up, so I forgot to set my face cam up. So there we go. Now we're back. So we're looking at my, my S5 right now, and like we said, Live, Live View Composite's one of those new features that we've added in the cameras, we've had it in a number of them, and uh, it, it kind of really shifts the way you can do certain styles of photography. If you're somebody who wants to do uh, any kind of shooting where you want to have star trails or light painting, this mode allows you to do multiple images captured automatically and then they're merged together in the camera. So you don't really have to do anything to get this. And the best part is it kicks out a raw file so you're able to then edit this in whatever software solution you work with with the same latitude that you would expect out of a standard raw file. You just get a lot more latitude and work out of it. So what's cool is that it's super easy to get to this mode and it works in pretty much any of the uh, the stills exposure modes that you would want to be using. So if I just click into the menu here, you'll see we come into the photo style options. Uh, this is where you'll see everything from like hybrid log gamma photo to high resolution shot mode. And then as we keep going down, you'll see that we get into where live composite can be found. So live composite, uh, did I actually do this? Go to here. Going to bulb. So live composite, and of course, as I'm going to be that person that's like, yeah, I know exactly where it is, and then I just completely forget where it is in the menu. Um, live view composite, you access it through one of the menu options here, and we'll actually do this how I normally shoot it instead of trying to change things up. Nope. So with this, I'm going to program live view composite to one of my function buttons on the front of the camera. Uh, and I apologize that I'm looking off camera here for it. So as you can see, you have tons of things that you can program a custom function button to. I'm programming the front one here to see where it says LC Live View Composite. So now when I press that front button, it brings up the menu and you can start with the setup to kind of create it. Uh, streaming problems, audio is a bit out of sync. Uh, is the audio out of sync? Okay. Well, just keep me updated. If audio does look like it's out of sync, just let me know. Uh, like I said, this is a new capture card, so um, I had to change some stuff around. Uh, so when you want to set up uh, Live View Composite here, you can do either you know set up your shutter delay uh, if you're not using any kind of like remote control, uh, but you would then just click Start, and now it's going to ask you to take one image that's going to be a black frame, which is going to uh, basically set up all your noise reduction. So this will allow the camera to properly get rid of the kind of hot and stuck pixels that happen with all digital sensors. Uh, and then just build off the image there. So if I come through here and I go to, let's say, let's go to a 1.6 second exposure and let's change the aperture to say, let's go to F10. So when I put a card in this, which would always be super useful. Hey, card. As you can say, it's, it's been, a, been a long day getting all this stuff ready to go. So right now, we've got everything set up here. I've got a uh, 1.6 second exposure, an F10 for my aperture. I'm at ISO 800. When I click the shutter button, it's going to create that black frame. Now it says that it's ready to start. So now when I click the shutter button again, well, I clicked it twice there, so we'll do it once, click it again. Now what this image is doing is it's just constantly taking that 1.6 second and it's constantly adding and updating and adding the next brightest thing to the image. So what this means that I can do is I can take on an LED light like this and let me lower this down just a little bit so it's not super bright. 
So as you can see, that image is there, and then I can just bring this in and start adding more light to it to then be able to just update this image, have one image that now I have full control over what the actual look is of it, and then just press the shutter button again. That image is done, it's processed, and when I go into playback, you'll see that I have the full high res or the, the full 24 megapixel raw image. I also have a JPEG out of this that I can then bring into software and edit exactly like a regular raw file. The question that was brought up is about wanting to be able to do things like taking the, um, the individual frames out of that as an individual still image. And, you know, if you want to be able to like render a video file out of this, the trick that you would do to be able to, to work with this is instead of using live view composite, you would actually use the time lapse function. So if I go back into the camera here and I turn my top dial, and actually I turn Live View Composite off, which I'll click Q to end. Now, if I go into my top dial and I select Time Lapse, I can go into Menu, Time Lapse Animation, set up my image count, my uh, duration between the shots, uh, and then just run my exposure as normal, so like how I would want those images to go. This is gonna capture out RAW and JPEG stills, or just JPEGs if you want, so that you can then put them into something like uh, Premiere or one of those other programs and basically just do an auto stack. So you can stack these yourself if you want using the, the more traditional old school way to do this. Or you can automate that and do the stacking in something like I believe After Effects where you can then create the image of the stars building through the sky if, if you're looking for that kind of shot. Uh, outside of that, it's not that there's a way that Live View Composite itself outputs individual images. So that's kind of the one main thing there. Uh, let's see some of the other questions here. Uh, Letterman Ian, uh, I see you're saying after time lapse. Uh, so the other cool thing is that the time lapse can be created in camera too. So uh, when you do time lapse recording with the. Um, with actually most of our cameras, you can take that all those images that you've recorded as a time lapse and have the camera output the video file for you. So you wouldn't actually need software, but that's going to give you a traditional time lapse option for it. So it's going to be a standard video that is all those frames uh, in time lapse or hyperlapse, however you want to do that kind of setup. Uh, let's see here. Uh, thanks again. Uh, are you using, okay, yeah, that was the question we did there before. Uh, let's see here. S5, so great, but when I use the Lumix Sync app to transfer files to my iPhone 12, I get huge file names like Lumix Sync underscore copy 2022-0301, all of that stuff, MP4. Any hints at changing this? I don't think you have the ability to change the file names uh, that are sent over to your uh, mobile device. That particular name seems a little weird, but I also haven't really transferred many video files over. So it's probably, that's probably being sent over that way because one, it's an MP4 video, and then what the iPhone is doing for its file structure and how it's saved. Um, because with that, you're seeing the date, the time, and then the video file. I can do a little bit more research on that, but... I haven't seen or done that many MP4 uh, transfers. So, uh, yeah, it's something I'll have to take a look at and see there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, S5 has a... Uh, S5 supposedly has a bug. Auto is maxing out at 6400 in video. Aperture, shutter speed, and manual mode. Uh, only in creative mode works as expected. Looks like a firmware bug. So I, that might not, I don't think that's a firmware bug. Um, creative movie mode is what allows you to go into, I, obviously into the actual pro video side of the camera um, to be able to unlock all of the actual true capabilities that the camera can for a video user. Using video in a stills oriented mode, so aperture shutter, uh, shutter priority or manual or even program on the dial is going to be a very simplified option for video. Not all of your codecs are gonna be available. 
Uh, obviously, not all of your ISO, ISO ranges are available, uh, and the ISO systems work differently there. So if you notice things like V-Log, HLG, some of these different modes that you can use are going to be different between creative movie mode and standard stills mode. That being said, there is an option in these cameras where you can go into, and I have to remember exactly where it is on the S5, because I just did this on the uh, um, on the GH6 in last week's stream. There is an option here, which is called Creative Video Combined Set, which allows you to change all of your exposure tools to shift between photo and video. So that's if you put the camera into Creative Video uh create a video mode, uh, your things like aperture, shutter, ISO, white balance, all that stuff would stay independent between the two. So this can help you shift uh, the different ways uh, that the camera works. Um, outside of that, uh, the other thing to take a look at is you have auto exposure in PASRM. Uh, this would mean that if you press the red record button while you're in a photo mode, it's going to be in an auto exposure. So it'll do auto ISO, all that kind of stuff. Ultimately, it just comes down to if you want the full features that the S5 has for video shooters, make sure that you're in creative video mode, not in a photo mode uh, to maximize what the camera can do. Uh, let's see here. Jake asks, uh, is the S5 capable of getting a 24 hertz frequency update to achieve 48 or true 24p? I remember this was mentioned in a previous stream. Just wondering if it was able to clarify. Um, so whether it's capable or not, I, I don't have an update on that side of it other than if you need true 24 or 48 Hertz or 48 P recording, uh, that's what an S one H is for. And that's what the GH six is for. So it is, it is a differentiating factor. Um, the S five probably fairly confident in saying this, the S five is not going to get stuff like that. Um, that's a system frequency change to get into 24 Hertz camera has to be written to actually work that way. Um, and if you do need something like that, that could be a big reason why you'd look at something like a GH six or an S one H over an S five or an S one, uh, fully honestly there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, two features I'm missing from the GX85 in-body merging for HDR and a description of functions in camera. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's on the GX85. A lot of the modern cameras are getting rid of the in-camera three-shot HDR. Mainly because the raw files and the general dynamic range is exceeding what those modes were able to do in the past anyway. Um, so you're, you're natively getting a much better file out of the cameras with newer sensors, newer processing. So it's not as big of a need to have a mode to do something that the sensor inherently is able to do better anyway. Um, let's see here. Randall says, when I connect my Anchor PowerCore 3 portable USB-C bank on your GH6, it doesn't give you the USB power supply, but rather USB mode. Uh, that's an issue with that Anchor PowerCore. Um, means it's not communicating the right information to the GH6 as to what operating modes it's in. Uh, so yeah, that's not really something from our side. It's what the actual device itself on the USB power delivery protocols is telling the device that it is. So um, that's the kind of stuff that you'll see updates for, not necessarily from us, but from other uh, accessory manufacturers. Uh, and it is one of the reasons why the uh, that part those particular devices that we have listed uh, I think I have the page open here. Yeah. So uh, the page that I just listed here, this is our, um, uh, the tested uh, power supplies for USB PD. That's why on cameras like the S5, yeah, it's rated. We've tested it. It works. Um, you have a couple little uh, comments on there about just the way that they operate. But then on cameras like the GH5 Mark II, it's still under, it's still under verification for power supplies. So, um, some of this stuff, it's, it's just takes a little bit of time to verify whether or not those things can work or not. Um, let's see here. YouTube's yelling at me that my bit rate has dropped down horribly. So hopefully things are still relatively smooth. The quality may just fluctuate a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Appreciate you and, uh, Penny doing these streams regarding the S5. Uh, I like the IBIS overlay you show if you're shaking too much, um, for it to handle it, uh, but is there more purpose to it? So 
This goes to another one of those kind of features that we have in the camera, and that's called IS status scope. Uh, so in, in the uh, S5 and a lot of the, well, actually all the S cameras and the newer uh, G cameras, we have a feature called IS status scope. Uh, and what this mode is designed to do is honestly just be a tool to provide you information as to how much camera shake or handshake you've got uh, in, in your particular scenario. So as you can see here, if I move my camera, I get the little bouncy ball that moves around. I'm on a tripod, obviously, so it's only going to move up and down. But what this allows me to do is say, if I'm trying to get as stable as possible, I want to keep that green dot as close to the center of that target as I possibly can. Moving out to some of the further extents basically is the telling you that you're effectively losing less and less uh, stability because of you're moving further away from the center. The, the amplitude, not amplitude, the amount that the the, the camera's moving is going to start diminishing how strong the stabilization can be for that particular shot. Um, outside of that, it really is just an added tool to help you get more stable shots. Um, the one thing that it doesn't show is forward and back motion uh, or roll, but ultimately the camera's going to have the control for roll and, and uh, was it pitch and yaw? But this will let you do left, right, up, down. So how much you're moving it just displayed in a two-dimensional uh, feedback. So yeah, I, that is one of the few things that you know we're, we're fairly unique in the market and actually still offering something like this. Uh, at least in the full-frame cameras, to my knowledge, I think we are one of the only ones in the full-frame market that shows and has this kind of tooling uh, to help assist in your shooting. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is it po is it possible to capture the live view composite time lapse through HDMI using an external Atomos capture? Uh, probably, um, because what I can do here is if I go into my settings, and if I remember where it is on this particular one, if I go to HDMI rec output, turn this off, and then now in the camera, if I change this back to stills. If I go in here and I turn Live View Composite on, take my shot, take my second shot, now, yeah, you're watching the image build here. So if you connected an HD, uh, a device out over HDMI, uh, like I have the camera connected in here to OBS, uh, you're watching the image build in a, in a clean looking image. Uh, it's going to come out at the resolution that the camera's set to. So from a stills perspective, uh, I'd have to double check what it actually says it's outputting resolution wise. Uh, it might be 3840 by 2160, but you can go in and typically change some of these, the outputs, depending on the camera that you're in. Uh, but yeah, you'd be able to put this into an Atomos or a Blackmagic video assist and record what's coming off the camera. Um, to then chop up and, and crop into a piece of footage that you want. So that's actually a pretty cool use uh, for it. And I think that one came from FC. So thank you for commenting that uh, point there, FC, and asking that question. So it does actually have a pretty cool uh, uh, capability for you. Let's go back to this view. Uh, let's see, where was I? Um... It was that one, that one, uh, TN. Is there any possibility of full frame high speed recording when paired with a Ninja V? Uh, so you're talking about higher frame rate recording. Uh, higher frame rate recording is something that the uh, GH6 is capable of. Um, we will have the firmware update that allows you to do 4K 120 into an Atomos Ninja 5 Plus. Uh, so you will be able to do high, higher speed filming recording. Some of that stuff, it's just a matter of whether or not that frame rate is part of the HDMI specifications uh, to be supported. But if there are specific combinations that you want, just drop them in the chat and we can, uh, we can go through and uh, pass it on to our engineers. Uh, let's see here. Um, best method for infinity focus on Astro, turn the camera off, uh, lens sets <laughs> or starlight AF. Uh, so with the... S5, as we were saying here, if I turn my info display on, another one of the unique, you know, kind of special features that the S5 has, and actually some of the other S series cameras have this as well, 
is the ability to come into your settings and under display, you can change and turn on, actually I think it's under settings. Nope, it's under custom. So I get for how many different cameras we've got here. So there they are. So you have two options here. You have one that's called Live View Boost and Live View Boost has two different modes. You have mode one and mode two. Uh, mode one, as you can see, is the screen is displayed brighter, but the LCD and the viewfinders refresh rate are going to drop slightly. So you're going to get a boosted amplification of what the image looks like, not the actual output image, but the screen rendition of that image. Uh, but at the penalty of a little bit more kind of laggy looking display. And then you have mode two, which really boosts the image, really makes it easy to frame and see at night, but it substantially drops the actual refresh rate. And part of this is because obviously as you are boosting it in the gain, uh, the image has to either be boosted in its refresh rate or its aperture and brightness. And since you're in the middle of capturing an image, you can't have the aperture opening just for preview. So you have two of these different options. You also have the ability to go into set and say, well, when does Live View Boost actually work? So manual or the standard uh, standard modes. That, in combination with the night mode, which turns the display red, uh, which obviously you can't see on this display, but it turns the display red, so it means that your eyes are going to be a little bit more comfortable and acclimated for shooting at night. Those two modes together allow you to be able to do use the actual manual focus tools. So in this case, like I've got my 16 to 35 attached here, I can actually manually focus now at night on the stars and be able to just actually fine tune where the star is actually in focus. Uh, and this is one of those things that will change depending on you know, I, either atmospheric conditions, what you actually want to focus on. Uh, and you don't have to use just the distance scale to figure out where infinity is because technically you don't really want to focus to infinity. You want to focus a little bit in front of it because the stars aren't at infinity. Um, but all of these tools that are in this camera, which are unique to the S5 and the S series cameras, gives you that added uh, kind of support for that kind of shooting. That and combined with Live View Composite for doing star trails means that as far as a night sky kind of shooting or astro for those that are actually doing more, you know, kind of like longer telephoto, deep spacious, uh, you know, kind of shooting, you have a ton of added assist tools here that typically you either would have had to mod a camera to allow you to do. Uh, and it just, yeah, in general, really massively updates what you can do with this camera. And... A lot of these features are carried over into something like the GH6. We have a lot of this stuff in the GH6 as well, and a lot of the S-Series cameras have these. So it goes to that point of where you can have the tool, it just depends on what your kind of focus is. The S5 is a phenomenal camera for someone who's bouncing back and forth between, say, video shooting, stills capture, uh, and you want to have kind of the best of both worlds and you want to have some of the more modern technologies actually supporting what it is you're trying to create. Um, so let's see here. And the next questions, uh, let's see. So that was the infinity. Um, yeah, the, the other thing you can do is obviously if you have lens resume turned off, uh, when you power the camera off and on, it goes back out to, um, infinity, which like I said, that's one way you can do it, not necessarily the way I would recommend or suggest. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, some of the other questions that came through. Uh, so, that's a GH6 question. So, um, we'd have to actually address GH6 questions, another one. This one's focusing on the S5. So, um, let's see here. For everyone that's asking about S6... S that GH6 questions, I, we're focusing on the S5 for today's stream. We will get back to doing some more GH6 questions. So uh, if I don't answer it today, know that we will answer it in a future stream. Um, so this one is here, uh, Dave's Nature uh, Productions. Uh, not sure, not well, it's, again, that's not about the S5. So uh, 
all of our raw files are supported in Adobe uh, and pretty much the big, the wider suite of software solutions that are out there. Newer cameras typically do have a little bit longer lead time for the major manufacturers to add support. Um, we don't have control over that. Uh, it's up to when their update cycles are for um, adding cameras in. So that's not really something that's in our uh, kind of category. Um, so cool. I think we're good on those questions. Cool. So one of the one of the biggest things with the photography side on the GH6 is obvious, or not GH6 on the S5, is that there are so many new ways to to increase resolution without necessarily having to go pick up a native high resolution camera. So even with our brand, you know, we have the S1R, 47 megapixels. And it's a it's a solid performing high resolution camera. It's actually ranked one of the best, if not the best, full frame uh, high resolution camera according to DxO. Now, one of the cool things that you can do with cameras like the S5 is deploy and use what we call high resolution shot mode. And this seems to have gotten actually a lot more visibility recently due to the uh, inclusion of high resolution shot in cameras like the GH6. The way these systems are a little different, however, is that in the S5, it'll output a 96 megapixel high resolution stitched image. So this will move the sensor eight times in camera and actually stitch them in camera and then output them. The big difference here is that you've got a couple really cool tools involved with this if you're a landscape photographer where you want to actually be able to try to utilize these high resolution modes, right? So for one, you have the picture quality functions in this, which is unique to the S5 versus the S1, S1R, and S1H. For one, you can actually output a JPEG and a RAW with this particular mode, where the S1, S1R, and S1H, it's only a RAW file. So the processing differences between these is a little, little different, a little more advanced than this one. And that's to be expected with a newer camera compared to when the S1, S1R, and S1H came out. So many S's. So for here, you've got a couple choices. If you select combined, this is just going to use what your normal uh, mode is. So if you've got the camera set up for RAW and JPEG when you're not in high res, combined just means it's going to use whatever your normal uh, options are. But you can independently come in here and select which one you want. So I typically leave it to combined. Then you have simultaneously normal or simultaneously record normal shot. This means that it's going to output an actual regular 24 megapixel raw file with your 96 megapixel high resolution shot. So it's one click of the shutter, you get your image and you have both your high resolution and your standard res shot in one go. You don't have to worry about uh, changing uh, you know, capturing a regular still right after you captured the original. They are identical images. But then what got most of the attention recently is the motion blur processing. The S5 has two options for this. You can go in here and select either mode one, which means that it's just going to capture the images and motion that happens in the image gets captured as motion that's in the image. So trees moving, water flowing, uh, it'll, it'll leave those images and not try to compensate for motion. But then you have mode two. Mode two uses all of the information that's being captured based off one, the, one of the reference images that the camera takes in the eight shots that it's using to create this. And it uses that to correct out motion blur. Now, in this, this is one of the first ones that we've deployed that has a true motion blur correction uh, in this camera, uh, it does a really good job, but we have evolved on this in cameras like the GH6. So this mode on the S5 does need to be on a tripod. It is designed as a tripod uh, high resolution shot mode. Uh, and you produce really high, really fine detail looked at looking images, but you also get a nice side benefit here that a lot of people I think well, some people I know realize, a lot of people may not realize. High resolution shot mode is not always just about increasing resolution in your camera. 
High resolution shot also reduces noise because you're taking multiple images together and you're averaging them for their noise levels. You can shoot something that say 1600 ISO on the S5 in high resolution shot and then take a standard 16, uh, 1600 ISO 24 megapixel image and you'll see that the noise that's created from a standard image versus the high resolution shot image is going to be wildly different because you're compositing images together and you're able to fill in what was noise with data now. So this makes situations where you want a really higher resolution image or you want a much cleaner looking image. The S5 allows you to be able to do that, capture the image, and then you can still output it out as 24 megapixel if that's what your end goal is, or you can take benefit of the higher resolution that it's created. Uh, the S5 is also unique in the fact that if I actually turn on high resolution mode, and I realize I'm not on my camera anymore, if I turn on the high resolution mode, you also have much longer in your shutter speeds that are available for this, this particular system. So I can go out to an eight second exposure where some of the other systems and some of the other high resolution modes, uh, you're capped at a one second exposure for each of those. And then I, my max ISO on the S5 is up to 3200. So if you're someone who really wants to get the, the best overall performance you can out of high resolution shot, the S5 could be the better choice for you depending on if working on a tripod is perfectly fine for the style of shooting that you're doing and you need to be able to shoot at higher ISOs or you need to do a much longer shutter speed than say something like the GH6. The... Benefit though for something like the GH6 is that your high resolution shot mode in that camera is one, it's 100 megapixels versus 96, so not a huge difference there. But the GH6, because of the smaller sensor, um, because of the, the much newer design, the brand new processor that's in that camera and the different gyro sensors, that camera can do handheld high resolution shot modes where it uses 16 images and the stabilization system to merge those images and give you all of the same results that we've got here. But in handheld, the motion correction is automatic. It's not a selectable on or off. Uh, let's see here. Some of the other questions that have come in here. Uh, is there a difference between the S1Hs and S5s cropped sensor size? So no, they're the same 35, uh, 35 millimeter full frame sensor. Uh, your 4K 60p options are going to be the same between each, so you drop into a Super 35 or an APS-C uh, crop region to do 4K 60p. Uh, the, really, the only other crop differences are going to be the fact that the GH6 can do 6K open gate, so 3x2 aspect ratio. Uh, the S5 has a couple uh, different limitations in the, the aspect ratios because it's a smaller camera and thermal loads are different between the two so let's see here uh joan uh okay uh here we go uh marcus using an andy sin c6 field monitor gives me focus peaking compared to uh gives me different focus peaking compared to the camera monitor objects were actually out of focus any idea why uh if you can clarify was it that the monitor was saying it was in focus but it wasn't versus the camera saying it's in focus and it wasn't um, if you get me that answer, I can circle back and try to troubleshoot for you. Uh, Jonah says, I love my S5, but I really don't use it to its full potential. Are there any hidden photo features you would recommend that people, uh, are missing out on? So yeah, basically everything that we're talking about on today's, uh, stream. A lot of it's going to depend on what your style of shooting is. If you're a street photographer, if you're a wildlife photographer, if you're a landscape photographer, um, there's a feature built into the camera that's going to actually aid your style of shooting. Um, if you have a very specific kind of type of content that you like to create in, uh, for photo or video, drop it in the chat and I'll, I'll happily be able to point you directly to a point, uh, a feature that I think is going to be beneficial for your style of shooting. Uh, William Turner. What SD card is needed for the 4K 60p 10 bit on the S5? Will UHS 1 V30 be, be sufficient? Um, short answer, no. Uh, you want, at bare minimum, you want V60 uh, media cards. Uh, and with the S5, you want to make sure that that card's in slot 1 if you're doing the highest resolution, highest bit rate. Technically, V30 is sufficient uh, for 
the bit rates that the S5 can produce. Um, but typically, I don't recommend V30 cards in general anymore, mainly because at that point, you're so far under what the offloading side benefits are going to be that the V60 cards, from a cost perspective, they're usually right about the same. Uh, and you're getting infinitely more by going with a V60 card, UHS-2 V60. Um, UHS-1 V30, they're fine cards, but when you get to the point where you're offloading the cards uh, to your computer, you then hit a band, uh, kind of a bandwidth uh, issue where you're going to be waiting relatively long for that footage to come off in the grand scale of things that you see kind of now, which is how fast things can be. So technically V30, yes, it's technically sufficient on the S5, but I still highly recommend at least V60 for the better overall experience from shooting to offloading. Uh, I think it's Yannick. Uh, is there a way to separate uh, picture mode from video mode? Example, I shoot vlog in video, but when you jump into stills, uh, you are shooting vlog as well. Yes, there is. So one of the other kind of cool things that we have in our cameras, which I talked about a little bit before, so this is a little bit of a redundant for some of those that have been watching a little bit. I have to get out of high res mode. Uh, is under the cog menu. And then under the first page, you have what's called creative video combined set. So in this mode, change all of these icons to the camcorder and you won't have that issue anymore of when you jump back and forth between photo and video being in the wrong uh, picture style for you. Uh, let's see here, uh, 80, to what approximate crop factor do you get when using the greatest level of stabilization electronic included with the S5? Um, I don't know exactly what the crop factor is, but I th there's a misconception there. Uh, electronic stabilization added on top of the in-body stabilization or using Boost IS is not, and I'll say that again, is not the greatest level of stabilization. Uh, electronic stabilization in camera uses the image information, so you get a crop, and then it uses the vectoring information to calculate basically what you'd be doing in post, which is warp stabilization. Um, it's better to do electronic stabilization or post stabilization in post software. Um, if you want the best stabilization on the S5, that's where you look at either the um, uh, dual IS systems so any of our lenses that support in uh, in lens stabilization and in body stabilization merges the two of them gets you the best result out of it but use the proper stabilization based on what you're trying to shoot if you're static not panning and you're trying to just hand hold a still shot that's where you turn boost is on if you're panning and moving and kind of walking with the camera turn boost is off leave electronic stabilization off, and just use the in-body and dual IS system. Um, those will get you the most natural-looking stabilization effects. Um, electronic stabilization can have the negative effect of, if you pan with it, it could give you a bit of a, like, kind of jump in the frame because it's trying to compensate for all the motion that you're doing. Um, that's why, typically in the past using, uh, and, and honestly, even now today, uh, using post stabilization is going to be a, a more refined way to do it using, you know, warp stabilization in your NLE of choice. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is there, okay. So I answered that one, um, for the S5, are there any plans for 48 FPS capture commonly used for filmmakers? Uh, probably not in the S5, uh, 48 P if you need 48 P in particular, uh, is going to be an S one H or a, uh, GH six in those kind of categories. They're much more designed for what I'd say is more hardcore leaning in the filmmaking and video side. The S5 is designed to be a balance between both of those kind of categories. Um, so certain more specialty capabilities like 48p, um, you're probably not going to see in a camera like the S5. Let's see here. Uh, is high resolution shot with its noise reduction feature something for low light situations then? Yeah, so the high resolution shot that you can do in the S5 it, it's going to output a raw image for you. So you're going to get the benefit of being able to get 
cleaner looking higher ISO imagery. So you're going to be able to take advantage of the actual higher ISO uh, for things like just in general illuminating an, a, a scene. But you are still working within some bounds. So it's an eight second exposure for every one of those individual images is only going to be eight seconds. And then your highest ISO is 3200. So if your particular type of shooting is comfortable with that ISO and that long length of a shutter speed at the maximum, then yeah, at night, it's going to be awesome for, for different styles of shooting. I've done it in the past, excuse me, but one of the things that you want to just kind of make sure of and be a little careful of is that an eight second exposure, if you've got say stars in the sky, you're going to get stars moving in that, in that high resolution shot mode. And it may not necessarily come out the way you want it to, uh, for that motion, uh, longer exposure obviously introduces more motion blur into an image of items in your, uh, general, uh, kind of frame. So you just want to be a little, little cognizant of those different, uh, effects that the exposure is going to have on the high res shot, but the motion blur, the, the motion processing does a pretty good job. Uh, but when you get to about eight seconds, you start really looking at kind of the crazy long amount of blur that's not really going to be easy to correct uh, in, in camera. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, William, would love to see a firmware update that could provide handheld high-res within the limits of IBIS, of course. So it, handheld high-res is definitely not just the IBIS capabilities. It's also down to the gyro sensors that are used in the camera as well as the processing that's in the camera. So the GH6, one of the reasons why you see so many new things in the GH6 compared to the previous cameras, even if they're tiny little ones, uh, is because it's, with the GH6, it's a totally new sensor, it's a totally new processor, and it basically gives you a, a fresh start for design and feature addition. So a lot of major differences in that camera. Um, all right. We're coming up close to the end. Before we, we get too far, I want to talk about one of the last kind of big things on the S5 uh, that I know a lot of people are probably in here to actually see. I raised my exposure here. This is what you'd never really do in the real world. So we're up at 50, 51,000 uh, ISO, uh, and we'll open my aperture up. I can drop my exposure down a little bit. So... One of the cool, unique things that the S5 has is the ability to record multiple different raw outputs over HDMI. Now, why I say this is unique, yes, other cameras can do raw data over HDMI, but where our unique benefit with this is, is that all you have to do with ours is when you go into the actual menu for the camera, all you're doing is toggling one option raw data over HDMI. So in this case, HDMI raw data output, you turn it on or turn it off. So what makes this so unique? With us, it doesn't matter which recorder you put onto the camera. The data we're sending out and the way our system works is that it's a seamless change between if you're using an Atomos Ninja product for capturing ProRes raw, or if you're using a Blackmagic Video Assist product, you can capture Blackmagic raw. Most iterations and most ways that this is done in different uh, platforms that have been deploying this kind of uh, capability is you have to pick and choose and change and go into a menu and alter things to get it. Ours, you turn it on, you plug in your monitor, it knows what the monitor is, the communication happens, and then it sends the right information to that recorder to then be doing the actual compilation and creation of that either ProRes RAW or Blackmagic RAW for it. So with our camera, you also get the added benefit that when you're using RAW over HDMI, you still have access to a lot of your tools, your viewfinder, and the actual ability to use the camera as normal while you've got a recorder attached to it. You don't end up shooting RAW over HDMI and then losing a bunch of the in-camera functionality uh, for things like monitoring and color accuracy and all of that stuff. So it really does become, when we look at a lot of this kind of, all of these different features that we have, you've got a camera that has tons of tools for photographers and videographers that just work the way they should. 
And all of this to say that you've got a camera that's about the same size as a GH6 or some of the other uh, full-frame cameras that are out there in the mirrorless world. But we're able to pack all of this con all of these capabilities into these cameras that don't have any reliability issues. You're not going to worry about, is the camera going to be thermaling on me? Is it going to give me heat warnings and then shut off in the middle of recording? Can I go shoot with this camera in, say, Death Valley and know that the heat's not really going to be a problem with it? Can I shoot with this in New England in the middle of a snowstorm and is it going to work? Our system, like one of the backbones of the way our cameras are designed and the attention we pay to the way these work is that they have to be reliable tools. You buy a camera because either you want to capture that family moment and you want to know that the camera's just going to work or you're working in a paid gig and the camera has to just function. You don't have the luxury of reshooting things. That's something that we've been at the core of our design over the last number of years has been just ingrained in every product that we make. Cameras like the GH6 and the S1H, that means adding an active cooling system while still maintaining the full weather resistance that we spec our cameras to. In the S5, it means being able to utilize things like raw over HDMI for the ultimate image quality and know that the camera's just gonna work. You don't, you don't have to question that. Um, and then the added things like the external battery power supply, USB power supply for long-term recording so you don't have to worry about how many batteries you have to bring with you. You can have one, throw it in there, and it's just going to work. Um, that makes an entire package for someone who is, you know, what we love to say is an adventurer. Now, that gets kind of, you know, in, in, in some cases, you may think adventurer. Okay, someone's going to be like mountain, you know, mountain climbing or hiking into the wilderness, something like that. But an adventurer is any of us that go out there, we create content, we are purposely taking a camera with us, whether it's for enjoyment or for a paid gig, going out into the field, creating something for a purpose because we enjoy what we do or we're getting paid to do it. Either is perfectly fine. That's where these cameras are just kind of so solidified into what their capabilities are. And we didn't even talk about things like 4K, 6K photo in the S5. If you're someone who needs to be able to do, you know, pre-burst functionality because you're sitting in a blind and you've got that perfect opportunity for a bird that you want to capture. You've got things like pre-burst. Uh, if you're someone who's, who's picking up a camera like this and you've got family and you know your kids playing basketball or soccer and you're sitting there and you're photographing and you're videoing and you're waiting for that perfect moment, that dunk or that perfect you know goal being scored, You've got so many different tools in these cameras that just add that extra level of what I like to say is comfort in being able to shoot. The camera just becomes an extension. You don't have to necessarily really think about it. Uh, so let's see. We got a couple of uh, time for some couple more questions here, and then we can uh, kind of get into the closing of this. So uh, one of the questions here is: Is there any sweet spot in terms of AF settings? Uh, universal setting for speed and and sensitivity. Uh, in other words, uh, with what settings does AF work best? So this is a complicated question with the cameras. So um, I didn't have it queued up, but let me see if I can uh, queue it up right now. Uh, we have an AF guidebook uh, provided online. If I can spell Panasonic, that would be great. Um, we have a couple guidebooks available online right now. All right, cool. Here it is. So this is for, uh, I think it's Ha-Rai. If I mispronounce your username, I'm sorry. So what I just dropped in the chat is our AF guidebook. We have, uh, there's three of them right now. You have the video AF guidebook, and then you have the kind of more stills-oriented S-series and G-series guidebooks. These give you some of the recommendations of different ways to set up the autofocusing system if you're using for video or if you're using for stills in different scenarios. Not one is ever really going to be perfect for the other, but that's kind of one of the things with DFD and our AF system is that you have a ton of customizing that you can do to the system for your different style of shooting, and you can save them in different banks depending on if you're a still shooter or a video shooter. So I would encourage you to take a look at the guidebooks. We have the, like we said, the video guidebook is the newest one that just came out. Uh, to play around with those different modes and see which one fits best for you uh, and know that you can be able to get in and just kind of tweak some of those for the different setups. Uh, 
for scenarios like I'm doing right now, which is just kind of talking heads, I'm not, I move a decent amount, but I'm talking to camera. The camera's not moving. I, I use in this case with the GH6, our face detection. So we've now decoupled face and eye from body. So you can do just face and eye. Uh, and I use our group area, which is about right here in the frame. And then obviously my face is here. Uh, to pick up these these modes and I think I have plus one on the AF speed uh, for me but I also shoot in usually either full HD um, 60p or in 4k 60p uh, for most of this because it's it fits my output and we did an entire stream on frame rates uh, which we'll link uh, as a card here that you can go back and take a look at so uh, let's see here Quick question, uh, is it possible to lock one of the two wheels while shooting video? I often touch the shutter speed wheel by accident when filming. That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, so on the S5, uh, you do have the ability to add what's called operation lock uh, mode on the camera. And I think I can, pro I can show it quickly. I think, yeah, there it is. So you have the ability to program one of your custom functions to being operation lock. And it has to be one that's not within the operation lock options. So here, if I turn this on, and then I go into the menu and then go to the custom settings. And then I believe there it is. Go to operation lock setup. So here I can change the dial to lock. I'll leave my touchscreen locked, but I'll leave joystick unlocked, cursor unlocked, and then display button I'll leave locked. So now what happens is when I press operation lock, you'll see that it says operation lock. And if you can see it, I'll do it this way. I'm going to rotate the back dial here. And now when I go in and look at the camera, you'll see that it says operation locked and it won't let me adjust the front or rear dial. So that that's an easy way on the S5 to do this. Uh, cameras like the S1. I think it's the S1. Yeah, so cameras like the S1 have an actual lock switch on the back which you can program to lock out these dials. Uh, and the GH6 now has a lock switch on the back that you can program in a bunch of different custom options to be able to lock them out so they can't be bumped or moved while you're in the middle of shooting. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, Jake, uh, is, I just want to clarify my previous crop question. The S1H, the menu is called Super 35, and the S5 is called APS-C. Just wondering if there's a difference between these two crops. Uh, not really, no. Uh, Super 35 and APS-C are fairly interchangeably used. That does not mean that they actually mean the same thing. Uh, but since the S5 is designed a little bit more as a general user-friendly camera, so if you've never picked up uh, an interchangeable lens camera, the S5 is, a, is really going to be the probably the better platform to just get yourself into. Where the S1H usually has a ton of extra features in there and capabilities that may be a little um, overwhelming to someone just getting into a camera. The naming of those is just to be a little bit more common for different user levels. In the pro side of the in the business, we know that the cropped area of a full frame sensor is typically considered super 35. But in the consumer side or the general side, APS-C is just easier to recognize uh, for what it is. But crop-wise, they're pretty much the same. Uh, actually, I think they're identical, at least the way we deploy them. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, uh, Simon says, yeah, it's nice, but I can't change my aperture. Yeah, so... That is one of the trade-offs there, is that at that point, it locks those different things out. Um, but... Yeah, I, I can feed that back to our team to see if there's a way to, to lock them out separately. So, you know, we'll we'll take a take a look and take that back to some of our team here. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, Chris asks, uh, any chance the S5 can drop the record limit in 4K 10-bit or extend it to an hour? Uh, so for, for performance reasons and quality reasons, that's why the S5 has the the limitations in time as cameras shoot longer and longer and get hotter and hotter, or at least as, as the sensor gets hotter and hotter, your image quality drops. You start to introduce more noise. Um, when you look at, um, 
higher end cameras like GH6 or when you look at something like the S1H, the reason they're designed to shoot unlimited recording is because they have active cooling and their systems are designed for it. The S5 is and has always been designed as a camera that can do a lot of video features, but if video is really your core of what you're doing, an S1H or a GH6 may be the better choice between those cameras, if that is your core. But if you need an ultra um, portable full frame camera that can do both, then yeah, the, the S5 is going to be stellar for you. A workaround for that, uh, for Chris, is when you attach an external recorder to it, you get unlimited recording in 10-bit. So it can, it can do it, it just can't do it internally. You would just need to attach something like a Ninja 5, uh, which is a night relatively small, or something like a Video Assist 5-inch 12G, which could also get you Blackmagic RAW, uh, or the uh, Ninja device, which gets you ProRes RAW if you want. And then at that point, you're also doing ProRes, and you get some other kind of cool um, options there, too. Uh, let's see. I can take one more question, and then um, we will uh, close out for today. Uh, let's see here. Uh, non S5 question hearing that the G90 is being discontinued in Japan with no successor announced. A bit disappointing. How come this has happened when the G80? So the, the G95 is not discontinued. At least I can speak for that here in the U S uh, the G95 is still a current camera. It, it, it's current. I'm not sure what the reasoning is between, uh, for the G99 getting, um, discontinued in Japan domestic market. Uh, but keep an eye on your local region um because the, the camera's not discontinued at least at least i know we're, we're not discontinuing it um so let's see here uh cool all right well thank you everybody for sticking around um i know that you know we we always go into these questions and and uh, into these streams and there's always so many questions that come in and we want to make sure that we use them as a as a platform for you guys to be able to get answers for all of them um i think the big takeaway for today really is you know with a lot of the the features and the tools that we have in the camera like some of the lesser known ones that we've talked about in the past high resolution shot live view composite even something as simple as the time lapse mode that's built into the s5 these are all things and tools that are unique to our line of cameras and in some cases specifically to the S5 that are there to help make your life easier while you're photographing and, and filmmaking. All of it built into our, our systems that are designed to be ultra reliable. So when it, it turns on and it does what you need when it's actually going to, to really just work. Um, we are going to continue doing more of these kinds of streams, uh, more conversations back and forth with everybody. I think next week I'll probably go back to a little bit of GH6 questions because it seems that we're still getting a lot of GH6 questions. So if you had a GH6 question today and you didn't, uh, and, and I didn't get it answered, make sure to come back next week. Um, I'll, I will have the link up for next week's stream right after this one. Uh, and we'll do the GH6 special features and, and talk about it. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure you bring your questions. If you have questions between now and then you can always email us at lumixlive at us.panasonic.com. Get your question into me there. Uh, and then I can do some research ahead of time and try to get, uh, you know, maybe a little bit better answer than what I have to come up with off the top of my head from what I know. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely keep, uh, keep going on with this. Uh, as a reminder, if you don't already, um, I would love it if you subscribe to this channel and give us a like on this video. It helps me create more of this content and bring more of it out to everybody. Um, <coughs> wow, it's a lot of talking without actually taking a breath. So I apologize. Um, yeah, if you like and subscribe to this channel, um, it helps me create more of these and bring more of this content out to you. If you have ideas for looking uh, at different topics that you want us to cover, let us know either in the comments of this video afterwards or shoot us an email at lumixlive at us.panasonic.com. That's going to be on the end card, so you don't have to remember it right off the top of your head. Um, 
we, we're always developing these specifically for all of you so that you have a place that you can be communicating with us and get the actual correct information instead of third party through some website and someone who doesn't actually necessarily know everything that they're talking about. Um, outside of that, uh, remember about LPS, we have Lumix Pro Services here and globally. Uh, it is uh, available in the U.S. in red and platinum. Overseas, you've got a couple different versions of it available. Take a look. Links are in the description below uh, so you can check out and see what's available in your region. As I said before, if you haven't already, uh, go give us a follow over on Instagram and uh, interact with us over there. Uh, if you share your your uh, your uh, content over on Instagram, we uh, typically ask if you want us to repost it on our page and share and all that kind of fun stuff. So if that's something you're into, make sure to go check out uh, check us out over on Instagram. Uh, like I said, I interact with uh, users over on Reddit as well uh, under the name Sean at Lumix. So feel free to uh, reach out to me over there and I'll do my best to uh, continue the conversations there. Outside of that, Thank you all so much. This was been this has been a fun stream. A little bit of a rough start at the beginning, uh, but I appreciate all of you that that join in here and and get in on these conversations. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and an awesome weekend. Uh, and yeah, get out there, create some cool stuff, and let us see it. So with that, thanks everybody. See you next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time, right here on YouTube.